Today's stuff we're going to be learning is Sota Daf Lamitet. We're going to continue with issues relating to Berkat Kanim, very interesting and relevant topic, uh, particularly if you're a Kohen, a male Kohen doing the uh, Berkat Kanim. But also what's interesting about it is uh, that most of us don't know what actually goes on, and today we'll get some insight into it. Uh, in Gethet this week, which is hopefully going to be up on the site at some point later this morning, Rabbi El Shimoni also talks about what's the connection between the Avodat Mikdash, the work that the Kohanim did in the temple, and Berkat Kohanim of today. What parallels are, or what connections there are, so you can listen to that as well. Okay, we're going to get started from the bottom of our of Daf Lamechet. We ended with a question: Let's study my um, Mahu. So we were talking about the fact that the Kohanim bless the people, and the people have to be in the room. We already learned facing the Kohanim. And then we said they, they could be behind a machitza, that's okay. They could be blocked by other people, that's okay. But they can't be behind the kohanim or in a different room. But what if they're on the sides? Do they have to be actually in front of the kohanim or can they be on the sides? In fact, most people often, or many people in the shul are ending up on the sides of the kohanim because of the way shuls are designed. So we're going to actually see that it's okay. Today we'll see why. Amar Abba Marba Rabba Ashi Tashma, let's learn it from here, Ditna. It says, and we're now on a totally different topic. We're talking about when we sprinkle the para aduma, the red heifer waters on either a person or on a utensil that became impure to a dead body. So we basically, one person stands there, sprink, sprinkles the other person or the vessel. Well, there has to be intent, proper intent. So what kind of intent is needed? If I intended to sprinkle the waters on you and you were in front of me or on a vessel that was in front of me, but instead of doing that, somehow, I don't know, I threw it behind me somehow. I'm not exactly sure how that happened, but end up throwing it behind me. And there happened to be standing someone who needed sprinkling a parajuma waters behind me. Or I intended to, to sprinkle it behind me and he's alafanab, but accidentally I, I sprinkled it in front of me. That doesn't count. Why? Because I intended it for you and for things that were in front of me okay it can include other things that were, like let's say i sprinkle on you and next to you is someone else who happened to be impure to a dead body and i didn't have intent that's fine because i intended to sprinkle on those in front of me but the ones behind me i had no intent for or the reverse but but if i intended in front of me and it went to the sides also in front of me, that works. So from those laws, we're going to learn that also with the Kohanim, that part of it is that the Kohanim are intending to bless the people that are in front of them. In front of them would then include the side of them. So therefore, the sides are included. Now we're moving on to a totally different topic. Very unclear why this is here. Although on Amabet, we're going to get to some things relating to Torah reading and shul. And therefore, it seems like it got to here because of that. Although it's a little strange why it's here, maybe it's a mistake that it's specifically here. Maybe it was meant to be on the next page, but in any case, we're going to read it because it's here. I'm a Rabbi Baruch Huna. Kevan shenifthach sefer Torah. You might be a little. I, I should warn you before we read this. It's a halacha that I I don't think in most shuls they're very careful about this. As soon as they open the sefer Torah in shul to be read from, asul lisapel. It is forbidden to speak. Afilu bidvar halacha, even halacha. You can't speak about anything. Seems like even the parsha, even anything. No talking. Not only while they're reading, but in between aliyot, it sounds like. As soon as the Torah is open, no talking in shul at all. Shenemal, where do we learn this from? Ubipitcho amdu kolaam. Okay, we're in Sefer Nechemia, and they opened up a Sefer Torah. We're going to actually bring this from two different proof texts that are both from. Sefer Nehemia, chapter 8. And it says, Vayiftach Ezra HaSefer, Le'enei Kol Am. He opens the book before all the people. Ki me'al Kol Am Aya, because he was above the people or something. Ki pitcho amdu Kol Am. And when he opened it, everybody stood. Now, you might say, oh, maybe this is why people stand when they read the Torah. But amdu here doesn't mean stand. Okay, the reason why people stand when they read the Torah, there's some people who have that custom, it's because they want to be the way the Jews were at Har Sinai when they were standing and they accepted the Torah. That's a custom. But this is something else. Amdu kolaam, they say, sometimes you to stand means you kind of stopped what you were doing, you stopped talking. 
So they meet, they say, stand here must mean, means, and everyone was silent. So when Ezra opened the book, everyone was silent. Therefore, we do the same thing. How do you know that Amida means Shiva? Amida usually means to stand. All of a sudden, we're, we're claiming stand means, means silence. Well, Shanaim they're going to prove it from a Pasuk in Eov, the Hochalti, Ki Lo Yidaberu, Ki Amdu Lo Anu Od. I waited because they weren't speaking. And Ki Amdu Lo Anu Od, when they stood, they didn't answer anymore. That means when they stood, they were silent. So therefore, they connect standing and silence. And therefore, it must mean they were silent. He says from a different place, maybe it's a better proof because you don't have to explain the word standing to mean silence. But in two psukim before that, it says, They read from the Torah, until blah, blah, blah. And then actually it's interesting. I'll read this next line, which is, Okay, it was the men, the women, and those who understood. Meaning the women were included as well. Okay, and then all the people were listening to the Sefer Torah. Okay, that means if you're listening, you're not doing anything else. You're not talking, right? You're not being distracted by it. So everybody was listening. Now this, by the way, would be more while they're reading from the Torah, you have to be quiet, but not when they're not reading. First pasuk was, as soon as you open the Torah, everybody was quiet. So the good question of, you know, which way it goes, but it does seem to say here, the halacha is as soon as they open the Sefer Torah, no one's allowed to talk at all. This whole question, because Rosh Shesha would learn Torah during Torah reading, how could he do that? He wouldn't hear the words, right? This whole question about it, and it comes up in Brachot, how they reconcile that with this. Some people say he was unique. He was a Torah scholar, and any kind of not learning Torah would be a waste of time for him, which wouldn't be necessarily true for any of the rest of us. Anyway, there's, there's a, there's, there is some sort of issue brought up about Rav Shesha, who would learn during Kriyata Torah. The Amar Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi. Ho Kohen, now back to Berkat Kohanim. Shalom Atalik Yadav Leisat Kapav. If you don't wash your hands before, you can't do Berkat Kohanim. Shenema, where do we get this from? Se'u Yedechem Kodesh, Urbuchu Atashem. It's a Pasuk Mutilim, which says you should lift your hands and, be, and sanctify them, which means to, clean, to wash them. Urbuchu Atashem. And you'll bless God. This sounds like a reference to Berkat Kohanim, and therefore they learn that they have to wash their hands before. Right? We generally do this. The Levites wash the hands of the Kohanim. Um, oh. So the students, Rabbi Lazar ben Shamua, asked him, He obviously was very old, and they said, On what merit did you merit to live such a long life? What did you do in your life? They want to know, they want to learn. And he says, Amar Lahem is going to give them. Three things he never did. Miyamai lo asiti bet kakneset kapendaria. I never made the bet kneset a shortcut to get from one place to the other. I never cut through the bet kneset, not proper kavod. So I always gave the proper respect to the, the shul. Velo pasati al rashe am kodesh. I always made sure. Okay, so here there's a, it's a little, you have to think about what exactly happened here. Rashi explains that the students would sit in the bet midrash on the ground. And therefore, to get to your spot, you'd have to pass over all these people and it's, you know, kind of step over them, on them. And it wasn't really respectful to the students to do that. So he would always make sure not to do that. So how would he get to his spot? He would obviously come first, be first in the Beit Midrash, and then he wouldn't have to pass over anybody else. So that was his, um, another thing he did. And the third thing, which is why we have this year, lo nasati kapi below bracha. I never did berkat kohanim without making a bracha before. Now you might think this is very basic, right? The kohanim, we all know, the kohanim go up. You've ever seen it, right? They make a blessing and then they say the three blessings. Okay, this says so not to confuse the words blessing and blessing, right? There's the bracha they say before, which both are called brachot. So it's a little bit tricky, which is they say, I'm going to see it right now. Okay, I'll, I'll just read it and then we'll go back. What's the bracha? Okay, blessed is God who commanded me and sanctified me with the kedushava. Or sorry, not yet commanded. Sanctified me with the kedushava Aaron, with the with the holiness of Aaron. He commanded us to bless the Jewish people with love. We're going to get back to this with love in a minute, but 
the concept is that before they say the three psukim, which are the brikat kani, they should say this blessing first. Okay? That's the first thing. So it's not, as we say, muvam elav. It's not a given. Notice he says, one thing I never did is I never did the brikat kani without a blessing. That means not necessarily everybody was doing this. Okay, but obviously this became the standard and everybody does this. And they say this blessing. So now what's this idea of Ahava? Rav Soloveitchik is known to say, in fact, if you're interested in reading more about this, it's just a small thing I read recently. Um, Rabbi Yitz Greenberg on his Facebook page had a whole long post not so long ago about Berkat Kohanim and about special he has now that he lives in Israel to be able to say Berkat Kohanim on a daily basis. And he talks about this idea of Rav Soloveitchik, which is a very well-known idea of his, that um, this idea that it has to be with love. And why does it have to be with love? And the Berkat Kohanim is really... Kohanim are blessing the people, but it's really that they're just a channel for God to bless the people. And it can only be done, right, to get God to bless the people if this is done out of love, okay? What Rav Soloveitchik points out is that there is no other blessing or commandment that we're commanded to do out of love, okay? There is no blessing like that. It's, this is the only one that we're commanded to do something out of love. And why is that? Because the Kohanim, right, and, and Yitzgruber explains very beautifully like that their job is to get up there. And he's a Kohen, so he describes you know, how much... He thinks about this when he gets up there is to, to get rid of any anger, any hatred of anybody else, any ego, and just to be feeling love for the community. And with that, that's what allows God's presence to be able to be there to continue the blessing. So if you want to read it, it's very interesting. You can go look it up on Facebook. Anyway, um, the idea here, so we now have, you have to bless, make a blessing before you bless the people. Now, this all seems to be somewhat preparation that you do something. And they, they say this about in general, if you want to do something that's going to, you know, let's say you're in the middle of your busy life and you and you take a moment to relax. Uh, there's no such thing. You can't just relax in the middle of a busy day and then go back to your work, right? You need before, after, you need to prepare yourself mentally. So the blessing before is, is part of mental preparation. This is what I'm about to embark upon. What we're now going to have is even before that, ki akar kare, when you, when your feet move to already start going toward the bima, to, to the dukhan, to, to say the bracha, which really the kanim do once they're at the bima, they don't do it as they're on their way. My amar, what do you say? And in fact, kanim say this nowadays. So here you say, right, may it be God's will that this bracha that you commanded us to give to the Jewish people will not have any mistakes or sin, right? I don't want to be the one to mess this up, basically. And it's a way of the Kohanim, again, mentally preparing yourself for what you're about to do, because this is something very serious, right? In Israel, we do it every day, but, you know, and again, right, in, in outside of Israel, where they only do it once every while, so you can imagine they have the proper intent, but here. On a daily basis, it's hard to always be, right, with the right intent, with the right thinking. So you kind of say this little prayer, make sure that I don't make any mistakes. And when they're done and they turn their face away from the community, because remember, the whole bracha is done face to face, right? You shouldn't turn away from the koanim when, when it happens, right? You should be facing them and they should be facing you. At the end, and we're going to see exactly at what point later today, when the koanim turn around and they face the Aron Kodesh usually, depending on the structure of the shul, but usually they turn back to face the Aron Kodesh my, and away from the community, my Amra, they say a kind of finishing prayer. What do they say? said to and taught him, God of the world, right? Um, owner, what's the word? Um, Ribono, the ruler of the world. We did what you told us to do. Ase imanu, moving now to Amabet. Thank you, master. That was the word I was for, sovereign. Okay. Um, we did what we were supposed to do. Mashiv taktanu, okay, what we promised, or what you made us promise. Hashki, and now they quote a pasuk, a long pasuk from Sefer Dvarim, actually from the blessings. After the whole section of the blessings and the curses, then we said, there's a whole thing that it says, if you go in the way of God, all this will happen to you in Dvarim chapter 26. So one of the things it says there, and when all the good will come, it says, Hashkifa, so now do, sorry, Mashiv Taktanu is this. Sorry, I didn't read that well. Let me just go back a minute. We did what we did for you. Now you should do what you promised. 
Hashkipa mimon kachecha, it come down from your abode, mina shamayim from the heavens, uvalechet amchat Yisrael, and bless the people, your nation, ve'et adama and the land, asher natata lanu, that you gave to us, kasher nishpata labotenu, like you promised our fathers, eretz avat chalabut basha, land flowing with milk and honey. So that's what the Kohanim say when they finish the blessing. Okay, and this in fact happens to them. Amar of Chista. Now here's an interesting thing. We're going to end with this last part, not we're ending the daf, but this little section. Amar of Chista. Ein akonim rasha'im lachuf kishrei etzbotehen ad shechzeru p'nehem in atzibu. So we said that at the end, and we'll talk about exactly at what point they turn around and they face away from the congregation. Now, until that point, if you remember, this is always the kohanim in their hands. Their hands are outstretched, right? Their fingers are not bent at all. They're straight. Well, they can't bend their fingers until they turn around, okay? Now, so that sounds like, okay, so keep your fingers open, but it doesn't mean that when you're done, you have to close them. But look at Rashi. Rashi says, so first he points out, like I said, they straighten their hands out, their fingers out when they make the blessing. Already in the time of Rashi, and they do this still nowadays, they make a fist. Kind of to show that until now we couldn't, now we can. So even though there's no real meaning to making this fist, they make a fist. Okay, it's a good question. You go to Kohanim and ask them, do you know why you make a fist after for Kohanim? Right? It seems like a strange thing, but they do it because you're not allowed to not do it before. So you're showing now we can do it. It's interesting the way Minhagim develop, right? Amar of Zera, Amar of Chista. Now we're going to have a list of halachot. These all are. And we're, we're going to go back to Kriyat Torah within this. Okay, the reading of the public Torah reading, which is probably the connection of what we saw in the previous Amud. We're going to start with Barakat Kohanim, and then you'll see how it connects from there to reading the Torah. And this is what I call, you know, we all, most of us, I would say, are a little impatient in shul, right? It's not always so easy to sit, and people like to move things along and make sure things get, you know, are efficient. If you're in a good shul, right, they make sure things are efficient so there's no lag time. But this, these halachot are kind of warning you about trying to make things too efficient and having one thing roll into another without having proper separation within each section, without appreciating each section for what it is. So they tell you a bunch, so Rabbi Zera in the name of Rav Chista is going to tell us a whole bunch of different halakot here. Amar Rabbi Zera, Amar Rav Chista, ein hakorei rashai likrot koanim ad shikhle amen min So the person who calls out koanim can't do it until not only till the Chazam finishes the bracha just before, right, the bracha of Modim, but until everyone answers Amen. Wait till they're done with Amen and then say Kohanim. And the Kohanim have to wait until the person who says Kohanim finishes saying the word Kohanim. Now, this looks pretty simple and obvious, but Apparently, it wasn't so obvious, right? The people can't answer Amen until the Kohen finishes their bracha, right? The Kohen says, Hashem and then everyone answers Amen. So make sure the Kohen finished the word Vishmerecha before you say the word Amen. And, and wait till the whole community finishes saying Amen before the Kohen continue with the next bracha. Okay. Same kind of vein, also Rabbi Zera, the same person said in the name of Chista. You can't turn away from the Tzibor. I said we get here. At what point can they turn back toward the Aron Kodesh? You have to wait till the Shliach Tzibor says Sim Shalom. And then you can turn. And you can't leave the Duchan until right, the place where you said the Berchah Kohanim, until the Shliach Tzibor finishes Sim Shalom. So you have to wait till Sim Shalom is over and only then go back to your seat. So two interesting things about this. First of all, um, I spoke to my father last night as a Kohen to just get some background information, like what really do we still do today? Anyway, he said, <laughs> the always an interesting thing to point out is that you know because they can't turn around until Sim Shalom, that means their hands are still out also. And, and they have to you know wait till kind of the Sim Shalom starts and or certainly until the whole Berkat Kohanim is over. And some of the Chazanim, especially in the times where they only do it once in a while, you know, they like to extend it out. 
And it's hard for the Kohanim to stand there holding their hands up, you know, and that there has to be kind of a sensitivity on both sides. Since the Kohanim have to wait, you know, you have to also be sensitive as a Chazan. So anyway, that's one thing. And then the other thing is, right, which also happens much less in Israel, the Chazan in general doesn't say very much. Um, but the other thing, that, right, that, that also is just interesting in and of itself, that there's different customs about that. And then the other thing is that here it says you're not supposed to go back to your seat until Sim Shalom is over. Now, some communities, there's another halacha which doesn't appear here, which is you shouldn't go back until Kaddish is over. And the reason there um, is that people say Yashakach to Yashakach, and they're all talking while Kaddish is going on. They're going to miss answering Amen. However, apparently many kilot are not really careful about this, but that, and then you see why, because it's not mentioned in the Gemara. It's just something that, again, develop later on. But Amar Rabbi Zera, Amar Rav Christi, Ein hatzibur rasha'im la'anot amen, ach tekleb racha mi piya kohei. Ah, now we're switching to Torah reading. But it's the same kind of ideas here. So the people can't answer amen until the bracha, the person who gets up to read the Torah says the bracha, until in those days it was the person who reads the Torah who said the bracha, so you have to make sure uh, they say amen, right? They can't say amen until the, the person who's reading finishes the bracha. And the person who's reading the Torah can't start reading until everyone in the community has finished saying amen. I don't know if you ever saw this. I've seen this in Yemenite shuls where every pasuk they say, they then say the targum after which is the Targum Ungulus on the Torah, right? So they read a Pasu, and then they read the Targum. So also, when you're reading the Targum, if you're going to be doing that, then you can't read the Targum until the Pasuk is over. And in a Koreh, Rashad Latribu Pasuk, Ad Sheikh Let Targum, Mi Piyam Targum. And same thing. First, you read the Targum translation, right? Can't, has to finish completely before the person reading the Torah goes on. Remember the first time I was in a Yemenite, uh, Yemenite shul, I didn't understand what was going on. I heard the Torah, and then I heard something that sounded like the Torah was actually a kid reading it, but it didn't exactly sound like the Torah. It sounded similar to the Pasuk, but a little different. I didn't know what was going on until I figured out eventually that they were reading the Targum Unculus. No one had informed me beforehand what was, that, what was supposed to happen. I was very, very thoroughly confused. Anyway, but here also, it's about everything has its place and make sure this is finished before you move on to the next thing. Other halachot about Torah reading. Now we're moving on to different types of halachot, and they're also said by somebody different. If you're going to read from the Navi, the Torah, you have to also read from the Torah first. That's why the last, the last aliyah is called the Maftir, and it's always given to the person who's going to read the Torah, and that's because of this halacha. Right. How did Maftir start in the first place? Many people think that it started because there were times where they forbade reading from the Torah, so they started reading from the prophets. And then once the Xera was, was taken away, they continued with it anyway. So, but it, in order to show proper respect for the Torah, so you have to also go up to the Torah and not only read from the Navi. But I'm Ravi Tankum, I'm Ravi Shobanevi. And I'm Aftir Rashai Laftir Benavi, Ajigalel Sefer Torah. Now we know why this is here, because, right, again, don't wait till they finish completely closing the Torah before you start saying the Haftorah from the Nabi. The Shleach Tzibor can't take off. Okay, apparently they would put a bunch of different maybe scarves or beautiful things on the Teva, which is the table on which the Torah was put. You don't have to take all those things off before the people leave shul. Okay, we're going to see what you do have to do before that. But mipnik tzibor, out of respect to the community, we don't make everybody wait. Okay, so before we talked about not rushing shul, right? But we do have to be considerate of people's time. It's not like we don't. We need to be considerate of their time. And therefore, you don't, if you're the person in shul who folds up all of those, you know, takes all those mitpachot and, and you know, puts, takes them away at the end of shul, you don't have to finish all that before they, um, before the community leaves. The community can leave and you can do that later. However, okay, there's a, most people take out the words until they pick up the Sefer Torah. In other words, they take it, they pick it up. What they would normally do is they don't have an Aaron Kodesh where they kept, they had an Aaron Kodesh, but not where they kept the Torah. Okay, they used to bring the Torah to somebody's house to protect it, right? They didn't have insurance policies and things like that. So you keep it in someone's house, 
to keep it safe, right? They didn't have safe slots, things like that. So they would bring it home. So basically you can't leave until they pick up the Sefer Torah. Shmuel Amar Ad Shietze. Shmuel says until it leaves. I just want to check one thing. Sure before I say this, that I have this right. One second. Or something I wasn't looking for. Yeah, okay, so I just wasn't sure. So, so, so according to Shmuel, it has to actually be taken out. And according to the first opinion, it just has to be picked up. Okay, it's confusing because it says Yanir and Komo, but most other commentaries remove those words and say that's not, that's not, uh, it doesn't belong here. Below Pliege. So actually, they're not, there's really no argument. It really depends on the situation of how the shul is set up. And now we're going to say, Hadi'ika Pitcha Achrina. This is when there's a different, exit and had delayka petra achrina. If there's only one exit, then the Torah has to go first. And that's because of, I'm going to keep breathing and then we'll go back to the other one. Amarava baraheni as barali, so baraheni explained to me, achare Hashem alokechem telechu. The Torah is like a representative of God. It's interesting that we're talking about this here because also the Kohanim kind of act as a representative of God. The Torah also acts as a representative of God. And therefore, when the the Torah has to leave first because you're supposed to go after God. But that's if there's only one exit. If there's two different exits and the Torah leaves one exit and the people leave a different exit, then it doesn't matter. The Torah could leave later. As long as you picked it up from its place and the Torah kind of exits the room of the shul where everyone is first, then it's fine. It doesn't actually have to leave the building before the people leave the building. But that's as assuming that the Torah is going to go out a different exit. Again, this is all the issue of we're, we're kind of struggling between, on the one hand, wanting to not detain people and delay them. On the other hand, wanting to show the proper respect. So before we were kind of lit, going on the side of proper respect, give everything its time, wait, wait till everyone finishes a main, wait till this, wait till that. But on the other hand, we, we, we balance it. We don't always, right? We don't have to take off all those cloths that are on the teva before everybody leaves shul, right? That's already too much right so we and then the torah it really depends if there's a different way to do it that we don't have to make everybody wait till the person who's taking the torah is ready to leave and then you know they all have to wait for that person to leave so that's a you know then if we have a way out then we do the way out if we have no choice then yeah the torah has to go first if there's only one door now we're going to end with this last part which which is going to continue into tomorrow's stuff which is what verses do the people say when the koanim were saying berkat koanim now you might be saying, what do you mean? You might be saying, of course I know what you mean, because it depends where you live. And there's different customs about this. Some people say verses, and this is more common outside of Israel. As the Kohenim are saying the blessings, they recite verses. And, and there's all these prayers about if I had a dream, let my dream. It's, it's a whole interesting prayer that developed around Berkat Kohenim. And in Israel, you don't say any of this. So it's interesting to see, we're going to get tomorrow really to the debate about this. Is it, or should you be saying, is it bad to say, is it good to say, is it, you know, what should you be doing? And obviously what you should be doing is what your custom is in your community. So it's not like we're going to end with, oh, I should switch what I do, but you're going to see why different custom developed. Okay. Why they developed in different places. Then that way I can't answer, but they did develop differently in different places because there are different opinions about this. But right now we're going to assume that when the Kohenim are saying the bracha, you're supposed to be saying something as well. Question is, So what should you be saying? Amar Rabbi Zera, Amar Rav Chista, same we saw before. Baruchu Hashem Lachav Giborei Koach. Okay, God is blessed by his angels, right, those who are strong. Baruchu Hashem, those should bless, right? Kol Tzva'av Mishartav Osei Ritzono. All of the hosts, um, and all the people who serve him are blessing God. These are all people who are blessing God. It's interesting, right? Because we're getting a blessing from God. And then we're talking about the fact that we're blessing God or or all the create, you know, all those created by God are blessing him. Right? And in all the places where he rules, I bless my soul, my soul shall bless God. So, or I don't know exactly how to translate, right? I guess my soul shall bless God. So now we have these three psukim, there are three verses from the same parak of Tehidim. And these are the three we should say, obviously paralleling the three brachot of, of the Berkat Kwani. 
Now they're going to assume, okay, that's the usual Berkat Kani. It happens on a daily basis in Shacharit. Okay, now, Bemusfei de Shabta Mayimamuri, a Musaf of Shabbat, what do we say? Amarabi Asi, Shir Hamalo, Tine Berhu Hashem, Kolav De Hashem. Okay, Pasuk number one, okay, we're in Kufla Medalit of Tilim, chapter, uh, verse one. Shir Hamalo, okay, um, the Song of Ascents, Tine Berhu Hashem, Kolav De Hashem. It sounds very similar, right? The, all the those who worship God pray for right uh, blessing. Pasuk number two, we already saw in the context of Berkat Kohanim, right? Lift up your hands and sanctify them and bless God. Baruch Hashem Itzion, Shochein Yerushalayim Haluyah. Now, those two psukim, by the way, were Tilim Kuflam, David, Aleph, and Ben. Now we jump to Kuflam, and hey, we don't go to Pasuk Gimel, which the Gemara is going to ask in a minute, why did we skip? Okay, so the last, last pasuk we say is, Baruch Hashem Itzion, God is blessed from Zion, Shochein Yerushalayim Haluyah, he dwells in, in Jerusalem, uh, why don't instead of saying Baruch Hashem Itzion, why don't we use Pasuk Gimel and let's keep with the three Pasukim we were talking we were in Kufla Medalid, Pasuk Aleph, Pasuk Bet and then go to Pasuk Gimel which says Baruch Hashem Itzion, which sounds kind of all one and the same right it's no different than Baruch Hashem Itzion, although we're going to see in a minute it's very different but sounds let's just say simply it sounds not much different I'll translate in a minute and you'll see the difference because that's in the context there of where we just were. Because the first two were talking about we're blessing God. The third pasuk there was God will bless us. But that's not what we're trying to say. We're trying to say we will bless God. And that's why they skip that pasuk and they go to the next chapter, which says Baruch Hashem Mitzion, God will be blessed from within Zion, and about us blessing God and not God blessing us. Mincha okay. Anita Maya. Now, another time we do Berkat Konim, we're not going to have two more times, one today and one we'll get to tomorrow, which is Mincha of a fast and Ne'ila of Yom Kippur. Okay, those are times where we do Berkat Konim, right? One of the main reasons we say we do it then, a Mincha of a fast, and also same thing for Ne'ila and Yom Kippur, is because there's there's um, usually we don't do it in Mincha because you're not allowed to do it when you're drunk. Talk about comparing, right? I said in Gefet, comparing Abadat HaMikidash to Berkat Kohanim, you're not allowed to do it when you're drunk and you could have drunk wine, especially in those days they drank wine as their main drink. So for Shacharit, you're not going to be drunk, but in the afternoon you might be drunk. So therefore they don't generally do it in Mincha, but on a fast day, you can. So it's at least one of the reasons. So now they say, what do you say in Chavatani? Now, all of a sudden, you're going to see a shift. This is different than what we've seen in Tulnet. Uh, if right, our sins have answered to, for us, well, God, you should do it for your name. In other words, if we have no merits anymore, at least do it for your own name. And the Mikveh Israel who saves us in times of trouble. Why would you be like a stranger in the land? Basically, you know, come save us. Similar idea, right? Why would you be like someone who, right, like a gibor, a strong person who can't help redeem us? Again, prayers for redemption. This doesn't sound at all like the theme of the other ones. And they say that what this is showing, and this was why I mentioned the stuff about the dreams, Birkat Kani was also known to be a time for what we call an eight ratzon. It's a good time to pray for things. So therefore, it's it's a good time to think, of, right, to, to basically include prayers for other things. So if you're a mincha the fast, but the whole idea is we're asking for tshuva, we're trying to repent, whole day all about repentance, so, and, and struggling with, right, it's all usually the fast days are because the temple was destroyed, or this was, to, right, there were things leading to the destruction of the temple. It's, it's recalling bad things and, and troubled times, it's a day where we use to kind of ask God for help us with our troubles. So while Berkat Konim is going on, we specifically talk about the theme of that day and what we're really needing from God. So that fits there. And that's why people say, if you had a dream that is bothering you, people will worry that bad dreams will come true. You should pray for it during Berkat Konim because it's an eight, Ratzon. It's a time where God is there kind of closer to us to answer our prayers. That how it morphed into that everybody does it, that's, again, a bigger question. But anyway, these are some interesting things about Berkat Kohanim. We'll do a quick review. We started with this issue of 
the sides, people on the sides are still included, even though, again, make sure never to be outside of the room where Bukha Kohanim is going on. But yes, on the sides you can be and never behind the Kohanim. So like some shuls, you know, where they stand is sometimes there's some people in front of them. So you have to make sure to move backwards uh, when that happens. Once you open a Sefer Torah, you shouldn't talk at all. And try to work on that, I guess. Um, next, if before you do the Berkat Kohanim, make sure to wash your hands. And then we have Rabbi Lezer and Shamoah who talked about how uh, of the three things, one of them was that he never did it without a bracha before. And from here we see this bracha and we talked about what the bracha is. And it includes this word, ba'ahava, which do it with love. Then we have what the Kohanim would say, and they do still today say, before they say Berkat Kohanim and when they end, when they're done and they turn their faces. Um, then we had that, and then they would make that fist, right? Even though the, the Gemara just said they can't make a fist before, but then they specifically make a fist after as the Minhag develop. Um, then we had this whole list of everyone has to kind of wait for this stage to finish before you start the next stage. We saw it with Torah reading. We saw it with Berkat Kohanim, and obviously it's with other things as well. Then we talked about the Moft here and how you have to also uh, read from the Torah and how you also have to wait until the Torah is totally finished. You know, all these ideas of respect for the Torah, has the Torah leave the shul? Who, you know, what has to be done before the people leave? What can be done after? Depends on the situation, whether there's two doors, one door, whether you can walk out without walking out before the Torah, right? Then that's fine. Um, and then we just ended with what are the psukim that the people say while Berkat Konim is going on? We saw number one in the mornings, number two, Musaf on Shabbat, probably is also Musaf on the holidays. They didn't really get into that. Three, fast days and mincha, and then four we're going to get to is Ni'ilan Yom Kippur. And then we'll see the whole debate about is it appropriate right now? It seems like there's no issue with saying these, these psukim. But then we're going to see a whole debate about is it proper to say psukim while the Kohanim are blessing you or not at all? You can think about this, what seems to you more right? Although again, like I said, you're kind of stuck with whatever custom is done in where you live. But it's an interesting thought to think about. Is it appropriate to talk while they're giving us a bracha? Is it not appropriate? Is it something we obviously should be doing or Anyway, we'll talk about it tomorrow. Have a great day, everyone. Shavuot time.